a certain Ulysses S. Grant demanded and got an unconditional surrender from Confederate General Simon Buckner. Grant's victory was spectacular, making Nashville unoccupiable for the Confederates. Grant followed this up with another victory in the Battle of Shiloh, when the Confederates attempted to regain the upper hand in Tennessee, but were repulsed by Grant. Yet the cost of this, the first major Union victory, was appalling. Out of 55,000 Union troops, 13,000 were dead. Of the Confederates' 42,000 soldiers, 11,000 were dead. It was the first battle of the Civil War where the carnage appalled even battle-hardened soldiers. It was not to be the last. Ulysses S. Grant was an unlikely hero. Originally a captain in the Mexican-American War, Grant had fallen into drunkenness after the conflict and resigned to avoid court-martial. Buying a farm outside St. Louis, Grant failed. He failed again when he went into real estate. Finally, he moved home to Galena, Illinois, where he worked in his family's leather store. When the South seceded, Grant volunteered his services to the regular army. He was turned down by officers in Washington who remembered his earlier tippling. Fortunately for the Union, Grant was undaunted, and he quickly secured himself a commission in the Illinois State Militia. The rest is history. Grant's critics and rivals whispered maliciously in Lincoln's ear, but that great statesman was unmoved by the vicious accusations that Grant was an unchanged man. To suggestions that Grant should be removed, Lincoln answered, I can't spare this man. He fights. Later, when control of the Union armies was handed over to Ulysses S. Grant, temperance advocates closely linked to the abolitionist movement demanded Lincoln remove Grant. I wish I knew what he drank, Lincoln is reported to have replied. I'd give a bottle of it to every one of my generals. For in 1862, while Grant was destroying Confederate forces in the West, the Union Army of the Potomac, under the command of General McClellan, was faring very poorly indeed in the symbolic East against the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia, under the command of General Robert E. Lee. McClellan's administrative talents had ensured that the army, under his command, was well-drilled, well-fed, and well-disciplined. But McClellan was a cautious man, and he continually put off an invasion of Virginia. This so infuriated Lincoln, who at the time was under tremendous pressure from the public to go forward to Richmond, that he stripped McClellan of command of all Union armies, and told him to go into Virginia with his Army of the Potomac. McClellan complied, planting his 110,000-man army into an area outside Richmond known as the Wilderness. But instead of leapfrogging over small detachments of resistance and pressing on to the Confederate capital, the careful general concentrated on mopping up operations, laying siege to Yorktown, and its small contingent of Confederate soldiers. This gave Confederate generals Lee and Johnston time to counter. They sent Stonewall Jackson's cavalry out to harass Union troops and make a feint for Washington, D.C. The move had its intended effect, sending 50,000 Union troops scurrying to the defense of Washington and seriously depleting McClellan's strength. Although Union soldiers were able to win several skirmishes against the Confederate forces, the first real battle of the campaign, the Battle of Fair Oaks, ended in a standoff with Johnston's rebel troops. General Lee then took over command of the Confederate Army, and the cautious McClellan first took up defensive positions, then decided to move them. <laughs> 
As he did so, Lee took the initiative, and the Seven Days Battle began. Between June 26th and July 1st, the Confederates attacked McClellan at Mechanicsville, Gaines Mill, Savage Station, Fraser's Farm, and Malvern Hill. In the battles, the Confederates lost some 20,000 men, the Union forces some 15,000. But despite their losses, the South prevailed. McClellan was forced to withdraw to Harrison's Landing, where he licked his wounds. He had been beaten in front of Richmond and forced to beat a hasty retreat, a stunning symbolic and tactical victory for the Confederacy. Union forces attempted to stop the disaster by sending more troops into Virginia under General John Pope with orders to again try to take Richmond through the frontal assault. With McClellan and Pope both in the area, Union strategists supposed Lee would be outnumbered and outflanked. Faced by an overwhelming number of Union soldiers, Lee did the unthinkable, splitting his outnumbered forces in two and sending Stonewall Jackson around Pope's right to attack the Union forces amassed at Manassas Junction. Never expecting Lee's maneuver, Union generals were paralyzed. Lee faced down Pope on the old Bull Run battlefield, and in the Second Battle of Bull Run on August 29th and 30th, 1862, the Confederate Army smashed a force twice its size. Lincoln quickly restored McClellan to his post as commander of all Union forces, as Lee followed up on his victory at Bull Run with a crossing of the Potomac near Antietam Creek. Lee had convinced Confederate President Jefferson Davis to abandon the Confederacy's original strategy of defensive war and to take the offensive against the North, striking deep into Maryland and Pennsylvania. Lee's plan was to cut the Union states in two by seizing the important railroad communication center of Harrisburg. Davis reluctantly agreed to the new plans. Such a blow, he reasoned, might push England's Lord Palmerston and Francis Napoleon III into formally recognizing the South, giving the nation Confederacy credibility in the world's eyes and forcing Lincoln to the table. Things immediately began to go wrong for Lee. On September 13th, McClellan came into possession of a copy of General Lee's plan of a campaign inadvertently dropped by one of Lee's lieutenants. The opposing forces fought a preliminary battle at South Mountain in Maryland. But two days later, on September 16th, the two armies crossed at Antietam Creek. On the small plains between the creek and the Potomac, Lee's armies could not perform the brilliant maneuvers they had become famous for, but they fought nonetheless. In the Battle of Antietam, Lee's forces were never forced to leave the field. But when the smoke cleared, 10,000 Confederate soldiers were dead. Although a full 13,000 Union soldiers also lied on the field of battle, mortally stricken, Lee was forced to recross the Potomac and give up his plans of northern conquest for the time being. Although the Battle of Antietam was technically a draw, it was the North that really won. In the wake of the Confederacy's success during the Seven Days Battle, both England and France appeared to be on the verge of recognizing the Confederate States of America. But Lee's failure to move beyond Antietam made the European powers reluctant to recognize the rebels immediately. In the interim, Lincoln issued his Emancipation Proclamation, a document which freed the slaves and brought world opinion to the side of the Union. The moment came, Lincoln later explained, when I felt slavery must die, that the nation might live. 
On September 23, 1862, just five days after the Battle of Antietam, Lincoln published the Emancipation Proclamation. The night before, Lincoln gathered his cabinet and told them that he had made a pact with God to free the southern slaves as soon as Lee was driven out of Maryland. Now that Lee had retreated, Lincoln followed through. News of the proclamation, which only applied to the rebel states where it could not be enforced, and not to the loyal slave states of West Virginia, Maryland, Tennessee, Delaware, and Kentucky, where it could, created a strong feeling abroad and permanently put off foreign recognition of the government in Richmond. But within the states of the North, it had an even greater impact. Investing the struggle against the Confederacy with a dignified veneer. The Northern cause needed all the help it could get. After the draw at Antietam, Lincoln ordered McClellan to pursue Lee into Virginia. But the cautious McClellan resisted, demanding a massive resupply effort before he would budge. Lincoln lost his patience with the wary McClellan and sent in General Ambrose E. Burnside to replace him. Burnside's orders were simple. Enter Virginia, advance to Richmond, and take the Confederate capital. General Burnside did his best to follow orders. He devised a movement south through the town of Fredericksburg. Lee, unfortunately, anticipated such a move, massing his entire army of northern Virginia along Burnside's route. On December 13, 1862, Lee's 75,000 men repulsed Burnside's 110,000 men in the Battle of Fredericksburg. Six times the Union forces attempted a frontal assault on Mary's Heights, the main Confederate position. Six times they were thrown back, reeling from the Confederate artillery and rifle fire. On that day, 13,000 Union soldiers were killed, compared to 5,000 Confederates killed. The Army of the Potomac beat a hasty retreat but Lee knew they would come back. The contest will have to be renewed, he told his wife. But on what field, I cannot say. The beaten Burnside was quickly relieved as commander of the Army of the Potomac, and General Joseph Hooker was given command. He improved the morale of the troops by bringing in prostitutes branded by the troops as Hooker's Girls, or Hooker's for short, and tried to improve the organization of his high command. But he was also an arrogant man who boasted, may God have mercy on General Lee, for I will have none. But it was Lee who would have no mercy. In the spring of 1863, while Ulysses S. Grant persisted in his siege of Vicksburg, and the 40,000 Confederate troops there under the command of Confederate General John C. Pemberton. Hooker and his 120,000 Union men moved south against Lee and his 60,000-man army at Fredericksburg. Hooker vowed not to repeat Burnside's mistake of attacking the Confederate forces head-on. Leaving 40,000 men in front of Fredericksburg to distract Lee, General Hooker moved 70,000 Union soldiers around towards Lee's rear and cut off Lee's line of communication. This double envelopment seemed to be working perfectly until May 1st, 1863, when Lee's vastly outnumbered Confederates split into three parts, defying military logic but confusing Hooker. Leaving some 20,000 men to defend Fredericksburg, Lee took the remaining 45,000 to Chancellorsville to face Hooker. After surveying Hooker's army, Lee split his army again, giving Stonewall Jackson 25,000 men and instructions to attack Hooker's right. At 6 a.m. on May 2nd, 1863, Jackson struck against Hooker's men who were at the time playing cards and eating.
Within minutes, the entire right flank of Hooker's Union Army was in flight. And within days, Hooker was back on his way to Washington. But for the South, the victory at Chancellorsville was hollow. In the evening following the attack, Stonewall Jackson was mistakenly shot by his own troops. His damaged arm, riddled by bullets, was amputated. But within hours, Stonewall was dead. Lee was devastated by the news, but was anxious to follow up his success at Chancellorsville with another foray north, into Pennsylvania, in the hopes that success there would bring European recognition of the Confederate government and end the warfare which had claimed the lives of so many of his lieutenants. Jefferson Davis approved Lee's bold plan, but refused to give him extra reinforcements. On June 3, 1863, Lee began his move northward with an army of 75,000 men, dependent upon Jeb Stuart, his cavalrymen, for information on the whereabouts of Union forces. By late June, Lee was in Pennsylvania, but Jeb Stuart and his cavalry, the eyes of Lee, were nowhere to be found. Lee didn't like groping in the dark, so he called his men to a halt and instructed them to dig in around South Mountain near Cashtown, Pennsylvania. From here, Lee could threaten Washington, Baltimore, and Philadelphia, and he was sure that would invite attack from Union forces. Lee was a defensive genius and welcomed the possibility, and he told his men to await attack. But General Gordon Meade, who had replaced Hooker as Corps commander, had been shadowing Lee for some time. Called a damned old goggle-eyed snapping turtle by his men, Meade ordered his soldiers to dig in and await attack, hoping to draw Lee out. Neither general was pleased with the defensive stalemate. And on June 30th, 1863, they both ordered their armies to move towards Gettysburg. The two armies made contact that day, but both fell back. The possibilities of engagement drew the bulk of both armies into the sleepy town. On July 1st, 1863, the three-day battle for the small crossroads town of Gettysburg began. At first, the battle went well for the Confederates. At daylight, Confederate Lieutenant General Ambrose Hill drove the Union forces out of town. Rallying on Cemetery Hill, and reinforced by fresh troops, the Union forces put up a ferocious defense. The Confederate forces took up positions on Seminary Ridge across from the cemetery and waited for further instructions. By 4 p.m., Lee had captured Gettysburg and 5,000 Union troops. With his Union troops pinned down on Cemetery Hill, Meade asked his second in command, General Winfield Hancock, to scout Gettysburg and determine whether the Army of the Potomac should stand and fight. Hancock reported back to Meade that a defense was viable, and Meade ordered it so. Lee, whose army still outnumbered the Union forces, ordered Lieutenant General Richard Ewell to attack the Union stronghold at Cemetery Hill. But Ewell bizarrely refused to press the advantage. By the time Lee ordered all-out attack on July 2nd, Union forces had been strengthened. When Ewell again expressed mixed feelings about the attack on the Union position at Cemetery Hill, Lee ordered Lieutenant James Longstreet to envelop the Union left and roll up the entire line. But Longstreet inexplicably delayed following his orders. And in the meantime, General Meade deployed more Union troops southward along Cemetery Ridge. By noon, Meade had eight corps either on the battlefield or approaching it. The Union left was formed by General Sickles and his corps, which had advanced without orders a half mile west of the main ridge position. 
Sickles was exposed here, and Longstreet and his Confederate troops attacked, driving around Little Round Top and Devil's Den in a series of frontal attacks, followed by a series of enveloping attacks on Sickles' right. The Confederates gained the ground around Devil's Den and the Peach Orchard and sent a deadly fire into Sickles' Corps. Sickles himself had his leg blown off in the ferocious exchange and ordered his beaten men to retreat. But despite the considerable Confederate gains, the Union forces held. Earlier in the battle, General Warren, Meade's chief engineer officer, noticed that only a few Union soldiers were holding Little Round Top, the Union's anchor point. And he seized a brigade and a battery of 10-pounders and sent the detachment up the hill. From atop Big Round Top, troops of the 15th Alabama noticed the weakness too. And troops from Texas were quickly dispatched with instructions to take the hill. Union and Confederate forces now converged on Little Round Top and a fierce battle for control of the hill began. Within an hour, 40,000 rounds of ammunition were fired in this struggle for the hill. Five times the Confederate troops pushed up the hill and dislodged the Union troops. Five times the Union troops fought their way back. Little Round Top stayed in Union control and the Confederates were repulsed. The battle flared again on July 3rd, with superior Union numbers beginning to show. Several Confederate attacks early in the day were repulsed, and Lee ordered General George E. Pickett to take his 15,000-man force and charge the Union lines in a last-ditch attempt to break the Union stronghold. In what is now called Pickett's Charge, thousands of Confederate soldiers advanced across the open fields in front of the Union guns. They were mowed down by volley upon volley of solid shot and shell as they attempted to take the Central Union position on Cemetery Ridge. The lucky ones staggered back to the Confederate lines. The unlucky ones, and they were in the majority, were killed. A stunned picket was heard to say of Lee, that old man killed my boys. With the failure of Pickett's charge, the Battle of Gettysburg was over. On July 4th, Lee began his retreat from northern soil after losing what turned out to be the bloodiest battle of the Civil War. Losses during the three days of fighting were 23,000 for the North and 20,000 for the South. And for every dead man, there was another suffering from horrific wounds. General Sickles survived the battle but lost a leg, which he kept in a miniature casket and donated to the Smithsonian. Later in life, Sickles would go to the museum once a year to visit his leg and to remember the carnage that was Gettysburg. As the Union troops pulled out to follow Lee's retreat, the tiny town of Gettysburg was left to deal with the thousands of victims who remained. Horses and men lied putrefying in the sweltering summer heat. Many of the houses and farms along the periphery of the battlefield suffered intense artillery damage. As both sides began burying their dead, the heavens opened up with a heavy summer downpour drenching the battlefield and washing the blood from the rocks and grass. This made the task of retrieving and burying the dead even more cumbersome. Thousands of bodies were pulled from the rocks at Little Round Top. Even more were pulled from the stony ridge at Big Round Top, where Union troops absorbed the initial artillery barrage of the three-day battle. The casualties were overwhelming. The crude makeshift field hospitals were unprepared for the wounded who desperately needed medical attention. The wounded helped give first aid to one another, if they were able. In many cases, amputations were performed and soldiers who were lapsing into shock 
were given only a shot of whiskey and a bullet to bite as their dangling limbs were sawed off. The carnage and suffering caused by Gettysburg and the battles preceding it were beginning to sicken both sides and destroy morale. But as the two armies regrouped and trudged on, the Civil War was only half over.